Hello, and welcome to Behind the Bean, a video series I decided to do because I thought it would be cool if you could see my game and hear me talk about it on top of it. So to start things off, I'm going to be playing together and talking about whatever it is that comes to my mind as I play. So, here we go. This whole intro cinematic, I saved until the day before the competition deadline uh, because I knew there would be no problems with it. It wasn't going to have any glitches, it's animation, it just works. So, luckily there were no problems and it kind of just got animated using all these tricks I've learned in school. When you start off, you get sent into the clouds. I wanted that to be the first thing you see. Uh, because I guess they mean a lot to me, just flying through the clouds. So right before you get control, that's that's what you see, and you kind of get thrown into it. But then you're you're left to go anywhere, and so it becomes uh, pretty open at that point until a heart appears, and then of course the title screen told you that you collect hearts and you get away from that pixel beast. So I'm kind of just running through the game and getting it done as fast as possible. And uh, this is my ideal path of first going underwater and then going above water. Those little effects on top of the boy and the girl, the, the white, uh, I guess, aura that's going around them when they're at full speed, that was supposed to be placeholder. And even this little hut on the right where there's a little shiny thing around the heart you collected, that was a placeholder, but I guess... Either I fell in love with them, or I ran out of time, or both of them happened, and so they kind of just stayed in there. The names of the altitudes, those weren't even there. I didn't realize that they would be important until I realized you wanted to know which hearts you collected or where you are in the world, height-wise. So I had to name them, and I think that name, Unfathomable, came from the movie Hook, where Smee introduces Captain Hook, and he says... He's a man so deep, he's unfathomable, and no one on the ship got that joke, which in turn made it funny because they're pirates and they don't know too much. This was kind of unintentional, but there's a gradient that changes throughout the entire game, and it just happens to be one screen height tall. So one indication to know if you're halfway between two distances is to just make the gradient go halfway across the screen. A lot of players did this so that they had the best chance of having a heart not transform into something else. It's kind of weird how the audio is, is muffled when you're underwater, but the sound effects are still clear. I probably would have gone through the extra effort to muffle everything if I had the time. The little smoke trails that move behind the boy and the girl that, I mean, it turns into bubbles when you're underwater and stars when you're outside the atmosphere, but all of that was pretty important because without it, there is no sense of movement. I mean, you can see stars going by and bubbles going, but when you just have a blue sky, it's the only indication that you're even moving, so... I was going to put the effect in regardless, but uh, it wasn't until I put it in that I realized just how important it really was. I spent about a day just trying to get all these sound effects together. I knew what kind of feel I wanted, but I ended up finding this this uh, sound of wind chimes, and they were just so smooth compared to the harsh 8-bit static of the beast, which really helped make them more desirable and make you want to hear the beast even less. I had some trouble with these stars. I mean, they should be real easy, and I wanted... I wanted every single star to move separately, so it would really feel like you're moving through deep space, but that's way too many stars to handle, and so it's just three different layers of stars, and the effect is good enough if you don't pay attention to it. That whole spinning mechanic started out as a debug feature. I needed to make the monster go away, and so I realized I could just tie it to spinning around, and then I did it so much I realized it was kind of an interesting way to shoo him away and give you something else to do. Some type of defense mechanism, because 
he would eventually catch up to you, no matter how fast you went, so that spinning mechanic was pretty fun to add in. The movement for the game is kind of weird when you look at it physically. I mean, you're moving your cursor to one side and the characters go in the complete opposite direction, but and it made sense. I mean, you point in the direction you want to move and the characters move back so you have more time to see what's in front of you. Right here, I'm just sacrificing myself. The original sound of the beast was a heavily distorted guitar, and it didn't quite sound right. I mean, it sounded creepy. It was it was definitely something that was not good. You really didn't want to hear it, but uh, I ended up settling for a, a distorted static sound. I didn't want to go TV. I didn't want to, the sound of a static television. That was the last thing I wanted because it's too obvious. That subtle static you see in the background right now is the same one used in The Beast as well as the surface of the water. So I used a few assets here and there to both save time and, and keep a unified look between things. Infinity's Midpoint was a title actually from a poem that I wrote back in college. And before people solved the true ending of this game, they... They googled Infinity's Midpoint and there happened to be some other poem that someone wrote about holding someone's hand and not being with them anymore. And it was just a freak coincidence and it's pretty cool people were looking for clues online to try and solve this. Because I think about two days went by in the competition and no one knew what to do at this point. People left their browsers open for a whole day and they realized nothing had happened. And eventually someone realized that uh, you can get back to the original island. And so, uh, so what I'm doing here is holding down the mouse button, which is a secret, to get to the island a little bit easier because the cursor points the way. Although the girl technically didn't really let you do anything extra in the game, you really could have just flown without her. Um, Story-wise, once she's not there anymore, you kind of realize she was everything. You know, without her, there's no adventure to be had. There's no danger. There's nothing to collect. There's... This whole island was added at the last minute, even after the animations of the introduction, uh, because I had to tie things together. I didn't feel I didn't feel very good just stopping it here, so I gave something. This doesn't exactly resolve the story, but it at least ties things back to the beginning, so it's left up to interpretation, and you can, you can kind of piece together your own story as everything comes full circle back to the beginning. So that's the playthrough. That was fun, but I thought maybe you'd be interested in hearing how this thing got made. So I had two months to make this game for a competition, and the theme was Sandbox. I have an undying obsession with flight and the sensation of movement and swinging and jumping and all that fun stuff. And I had this animation I wanted to do for years where there's this boy running on a cliff and he jumps off and starts flying into the air. And so now all I had to do was make a game around that. So I added a goal, which was the hearts, of course, and I needed some type of danger or conflict, and that was the Pixel Beast, which at first was able to kill you, but uh, I realized that would break the flow of the game, and do you keep the hearts, do you lose them, and so I realized I can't kill you, so, so then what happens when he eats you, which is where I came up with having the heart inside of him, which was kind of fun, and I wish I could do that in other places in the game, but I really couldn't think of too much else. And the whole background would have been filled with creatures and colors and lights and all these wonderful things like whales at the bottom of the ocean and schools of fish and rainbows leading up into the sky and rockets going into outer space. And uh, at least the rockets turned into one of the hearts in the Astral Heights section, so that's nice. And then there would have been planets in outer space and stuff like that. The original ending was nothing. Literally, you flew into this white abyss of nothingness until you realized there was nothing to do and then you gave up and got really sad. And while that was pretty close to the message I wanted to deliver, 
it was just way too mean. I mean, you worked this hard to get all these hearts, and, and you're rewarded with literally nothing. And so I found a way to end the game, but not exactly finish the story. So it's left open-ended in how it ties back to the beginning. So I was pretty satisfied with that. Another thing I wanted to talk about is where I stole my ideas from, because, let's be honest, we all are guilty of taking really cool ideas from elsewhere and putting them into our own work and hopefully giving them a little spin, so at least they're not a complete ripoff. The title screen to the game shows the game already in progress, as if the girl had been waiting on the cliff forever, and when you get to the end of the game, it goes right back to the beginning. And those two elements were taken directly from a freeware game called Don't Look Back by Terry Cavanaugh. I thought it worked really well. It immediately gets you right into the game. The letterboxes that appear in the intro cinematic were taken from Zelda Ocarina of Time whenever you have a little cinematic play for Link, such as when the doors lock behind you or whatever. It was a nice way to show that you don't have control over the game, and so when they disappear, it kind of tells you now it's time to play. The Belly of the Beast was taken from a boss battle in Yoshi's Island, and I think his name was Prince Froggy. You go inside of his belly and you swallow Shy Guys and shoot eggs at his uvula, which is in his stomach for some reason. The ending to the game is pretty unconventional. It's There's no you win or congratulations or even a game over. And I got that inspiration from a freeware game called Chaser, which had a unique ending that uh, really opened my eyes to what you can do and not do in a game. As a lot of people pointed out, the beast is really close to that smoke monster thing from the TV show Lost, and once I realized that I was totally ripping this thing off, I decided to call it Beast from then on, never really using the word monster. The chords from the soundtrack were taken from a song called Kiss Me by Sixpence None the Richer. It's a charming little song from the 90s about... Uh, Trying to get a boy to kiss you, I think. The way the song goes into a low-pass filter when you go underwater was inspired by Geometry Wars whenever you plant a bomb and then the music just drowns out. And I think having the game start out on a grassy cliff was taken from my own game that came before this, How My Grandfather Won the War, where an airplane takes off from a grassy cliff. I figured it might be cool to also show you kind of where the game came from visually. So here the game pretty much started out as a blue rectangle and a pink rectangle moving together. And for those of you film geeks out there, that box in the center uh, is marked off for the thirds. So I was trying to get the characters to be in pleasing spots whenever you went to the corners. I eventually added in bending because I knew I wanted them to arc. It just didn't feel right when they were swiveling around and staying static. Next thing that was added was the beast, which had some pretty crazy movements at first, and it was definitely toned down a little bit later on. And pretty much the first thing that I finalized was the clouds. I really wanted them to look right, so I started them early on, and once I got a good feel for them, then I created the rest of the world around them. I also had plans to have the game move through different times of day, such as sunset that you see here, or nighttime, dusk, and dawn, and things like that. So that ended up not being in the game, obviously. But I really just love this visual here of the silhouetted characters in clouds over a backlit sky. And that actually survived in the loading screen for the game. So that was fun to keep. And lastly, I wanted to answer some questions from you guys. Uh, I've been asking for about a week to send questions in, and if you never got to send any questions in, feel free to keep on asking me because I'm going to be doing a few more of these videos, obviously focused on my other games. So first up is from Chelsea asking, why are you so heteronormative gosh? Just a little background info, Chelsea is the girl I worked with on a game called The End of Us, which was a global game jam entry from earlier this year. And she's asking because this is pretty important to her, and I've gotten a bit of a response from the community surrounding this topic, mostly from Chelsea, but basically the gist is that my games have a lot of blue boys and pink girls, and why don't I do something outside of that spectrum? And I suppose the answer is because I wanted to have a blue boy holding the hand of a pink girl flying off into the clouds. 
I wasn't trying to make a statement about anything outside of what this game shows you. It's pretty much as simple as that. Next question is from Hen Kekum, who says, What stands out to me in Together is the pacing. Was this a conscious effort, and if so, how much time did it take? So, I think this comes from the fact that I'm basically a slow person in life. I'm never really in a rush to get anywhere, and that just comes through in my games. So, what I like to do is actually make the games too fast. I purposely make them fast knowing that I'm a slow person, and then I'll play test them over and over and realize that they're just too fast. And so really, whenever I tweak time, I'm usually adding it. So for example, in this game, the time it takes for the girl to turn around when you hit play, or how long the screen stays black when you get eaten by the beast, or how long it takes for the next heart to appear, or even how long the game holds on the girl at the end of the game until the title screen reappears. Those were all breaths of air you had to take in the game. I always wanted to stop and just take a moment to to really take in what's going on. Lastly, Mitty asks, are some elements from your games inspired by your own life? And this is a definite yes. I mean, the fact that there's a boy wearing clothes very similar to what I sometimes wear, that's a dead giveaway for people who know me. But there are other elements, like the fact that the characters can just fly underwater and go as deep as they want without any repercussions. That is a direct response to my personal fear of water, so for something that I have trouble doing in the real world, it really helps me out that my characters in my games are able to do it so easily. And then of course I can't fly either, so it's pretty cool if they can do that too. So that's basically it. That was kind of fun to talk about this stuff. I haven't uh, really looked at this game for about a year, so it's nice to go back and take a look at it. I'm not sure what game I'm doing next, but I would like to keep these things going because uh, they've been pretty fun. Again, feel free to ask questions about my games. I'll try and answer them at the end or somewhere throughout. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.